Welcome back to the Gas Compression Podcast. I'm excited to continue our series in what we're calling the, the blue collar hiring issues and workforce, labor force. And today we've got Ann Flager. She's the current director of office operations at Hancock Structural Steel. And I also, you're the past president of the National Association of Women in Construction. Is that right? That's correct. It looks like you've been a board member for about 15 years. Uh, I've been a member for 15 years. I've a been member. on the national board since 2014. Well, cool. I'm excited to talk about that because the manual labor skilled trades is, I don't know, you probably know the percentage. What percentage is it men and women? Well, we are finally over 10%. It's taken us quite a while to get over 10%. So 90%. Yeah. Okay. 90, 10. All right. Yeah. And uh, well, let's just, well, let's first, let's start with your background. So you, um, you've been in construction industry for a while. How you, uh, you're in Ohio, correct? Yes. So tell me about growing up where you went to school and how you got in the construction business. Uh, well, I went to high school. I graduated from Fremont Ross in Fremont, Ohio, we moved around a lot. Uh, my dad was a drug and alcohol administrator, so he would start a rehabilitation center and then we move. Uh, but I actually graduated from Fremont Ross. And then I went to Bowling Green State University for college for a few years and was going into business. Um, then I got uh, hooked up with a trucking company and which I later found out that trucking is a part of construction. Uh, you, you got to imagine all the things that construction touches, you know, from mm -hmm. trucking to subcontractors, suppliers, GCs, the list goes on and on. So it was kind of interesting that I didn't realize uh, until I joined a general contractor, and became a part of NAWIC, that trucking is also considered uh, construction if you're hauling those materials. All right. Then I needed to find a job closer to home, and I applied for a receptionist position at uh, a general contractor in the, in the city that I lived in, in Finley. And the interview went really well. I was speaking to the owner of the company and towards the end of the conversation, she said, well, I'm not going to hire you for the receptionist position. And then the first thought in my mind was what, what happened? I, I thought we had a great interview going here. She said, we're not looking for a project administrator right now, but we're going to make a position for you. So instead of being hired as a receptionist, I was hired as a project administrator. And then I moved up to the ranks to senior project administrator. And then I really loved numbers. So I got involved with estimating. I estimated pre-engineered middle buildings. Mm -hmm. And then just recently, I moved from the general contractor to the sister company, which is a structural steel fabrication, when I had the opportunity to be the, office, uh, the director of office operations. So I just started this role in October and am loving it. All right. So in the, com in the commercial construction business, do you, what is it about that industry that you like so much versus, you know, crunching numbers in a different type of industry or company or business? I think for me, working in the construction industry is twofold. Uh, one, you know, women are not the minority and I'm always been a person that wants to support and help others do and be what they want to be in their lives. So helping other women out. So that's been that's been one reason why I've stayed in the construction industry. But not too many people can say when they're driving down the road and they see a building that they had a part in, whatever part it is, you know, that building is going to be there for a long time after you're you're in existence on earth. So just being able to be in an industry like this, that's what I love about it is that I can say I helped you know, build that building there, whether it be I estimated it or um, I worked on the project side or even hiring, you know, people to, to construct the building or make the steel or, you know, whatever part the, the building that they had in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's <clears throat> something I feel like we need to do a better job of in, in all of the skilled trades. I'm in the machine shop business and we were just, we were talking about that yesterday about, you know, from a, uh, you know, in the, like an executive position or an office position, I don't do that anymore. I don't get to build anything. I don't get to stand back and look at anything and say, you know, look what I did today. It's uh, it is, it's really rewarding. So, well, let's, let's talk about your, your previous role, you, and I guess you may, are you still in, involved in hiring and all of that in your current role? At yes. Hancock? Okay. Yes. I'm still, we're, we're looking for welders, fabricators, uh, painters. Yeah. We're, we're, we're feeling the job. 
uh, labor shortage like everybody else's. Okay, so let's talk about that. So this podcast is dedicated to the gas compression industry, which is, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's mechanics, it's companies that, you know, midstream and companies that, and upstream companies that would um, need mechanics and people to go out and work on engines. And and I'm in the machine shop business, so I need machine shop, machinists, mechanics. You're in the con- commercial construction space. So it really is all the same, I feel, in terms of we're com- you know, who we're competing against for jobs. And I've had a couple of, of people on the podcast, one of them who said, you know, you're not, you're not just competing, you know, as a construction company, you're not competing with just another construction company. When Amazon comes to town and offers 18 bucks an hour to drive a forklift, well, then now we're competing against them. And so what, uh, what are your thoughts on the, the great resignation and the, this, the, the hiring trends in industry of, of in, in our industries, in the, in the skilled trade industries? Well, right now, I think uh, the pandemic has really hurt hiring people. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but, you know, with, with what the government has been doing with, I know they've been wanting to help us out, but there are people out there that um, can work. And I know that now that that's kind of stopped, they're going to be looking for jobs and, uh, we just need to communicate out to them that, you know, construction was considered essential. So throughout the pandemic, uh, it remained. Many of us, you know, still continued to work. I personally, since I'm not on the job site, I worked from home, but I still participated in estimating in the project meetings and things of that sort. And with the way that technology is right now too, that can really uh, help the younger generation because they're all about technology. We just need to be communicating with them, you know, how we're uh, updating our technology in our companies and how they can use it if they would come to work for us. The other thing uh, that being a woman in the construction industry, it's very important to for me to get out and talk to not only women, but, you know, young men as well to let them know about getting into construction and how it can be a viable career and that you don't have to have a college degree uh, in many you know, uh, places to work in construction. You can, you know, join an apprenticeship program. Um, you can, you know, get training elsewhere, but you don't have to get a full four year college degree and you don't have all that debt. You can be making money as you're getting trained, which I don't think a lot of people realize. But the high schools are finally starting to realize that. And so guidance counselors are now more talking to the students about working in construction, not just pushing everybody into college because not everybody's, you know, they don't have the, the well with all to go to college and, you know, stick it out for four years just to get a degree and have all this debt. So I am very pleased that we are now getting more receptive when we go to high schools and they'll let us talk to the students about construction and all the different possibilities that they have there. But it's really important, I think, for uh, companies when you're looking for Um, help that you look for them and maybe talk to somebody that maybe doesn't have the best resume. Until you sit down and talk to somebody, you really don't know what their capabilities are. So a lot of times, especially with women, uh, if we don't have 100% of everything that's listed on a a job responsibilities, duties, things of that sort, we won't apply for the position. Whereas men, if they got maybe 65, 70% of it, they'll apply for it. So women may not apply for these positions that they're very capable of doing, but if as companies, um, we reach out to them and sit down and talk to them, that number one, you know, shows them that the company is interested, it will build their confidence, and you just might find uh, the right person. And I think by going out and seeking uh, employees, not just, you know, posting an ad on Deed or in the paper, but really legitimately going out and trying to find job fairs, I know some of them are becoming virtual now. But if you're actually physically out there looking for uh, employees, I think you're going to get a better response and you're going to get employees that will stay longer because, yes, uh, it's a lot of times uh, you get an employee and if they can make it through the first 90 days, you pretty much have them. But if they, you know, come and go, and I found that most of them come and go are the ones that we've gotten from just job ads instead of actually physically going out and talking to people and looking for them ourselves. What, what do you mean by physically going out and looking for people? Is that uh, like job? attending job fairs um, in your local area? Again, you know, with technology, they're having virtual job fairs now 
where your company, you can, you know, be at this job fair for a certain number of hours and uh, people can come and they can uh, sign up to talk to you. And you're, you're doing a more one-on-one, almost like an immediate interview. But again, when you can actually talk to somebody right there at the beginning and get to know them and let them get to know you and the company, I think you have a, you'll be able to get somebody that will stay for longer than you're just getting somebody that comes in off the street. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times if they're just coming in off the street, it's to meet a quota, um, you know, because they're required to stop at so many places to, you know, get job applications. So it's a little bit more effort, but I think that in the long run, um, you'll get better people to work for you and they'll, let, they'll stay longer. You mentioned about high schools and them kind of coming around. That's happening in our area. I'm in Amarillo, Texas, and the Amarillo ISD just built a huge, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the name of it is, but it's basically a center for, you know, juniors and seniors in high school to come in and start getting hands-on training with stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you have a personal relationship with high schools, with counselors that you're seeking them out and you're talking to them and having conversations, or is it just more of a, just you're, you're aware of their programs? Uh, I get involved as much as I can in the area. NAWIC has really been a big help with that. Um, we have some programs that help to uh, engage um, students starting as early as first grade all the way up through high school to let them know about construction. And as I mentioned, the schools are, are more receptive to us coming in. Also, I participate in local panels. A lot of the schools, especially uh, the trade schools, uh, or career centers um, that you mentioned where they go for junior, senior, they want to periodically throughout the year have panel discussions and they want to get a diverse you know, workforce. So even though I work in construction, I've done panels where you know, it was like an automotive program. Uh, but just being there in front of them and talking to them about um, that it's okay to work if, even if you're the minority. I mean, you can you can do so much with whatever you want to do. So don't, don't let it stop you if um, you're maybe not the, ma- not the majority in that career. So I, with the pandemic, that has really slowed it down. We've tried to do some virtual ones and there's actually some national uh, companies that are connecting people virtually. So for example, one time I'm here on my lunch hour and I actually attended a high school in Kansas City, Missouri and talked to them about construction. So again, technology is really providing the opportunities for, for people to, to reach the students all across the country. Yeah. How about an apprentice program? Do you, does, does uh, Hancock have, a, have an apprentice program that you currently use? No, we do not have an apprentice program. We're really a, a smaller steel fabrication shop. We only have about 15 uh, fabricators and welders and, and employees that work in the shop. So, uh, but we do... Uh, we do get a lot of students that come out of our local uh, trade school. It's called um, Millstream, where like the juniors and seniors, they go to welding uh, for those two years. And we usually bring them in and, you know, teach them more, but we don't have a formal uh, apprenticeship program. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in the same boat. We haven't figured out the way to do that with, you know, we have a lot of skin in the game or you would if you said hey come to work and we'll pay you while we train you Mm -hmm. but there's no real guarantee that they'll stick around and so there's all that's the thing we're trying to figure out how to how to make that work i mean if you've got 500 employees that's that's a lot easier to do when you've got 15. yes so we're, we're trying to figure out that official apprentice program where we can bring people in ours is a third generation business and my you know my dad will tell me stories that's that's just always how it was Mm -hmm. if someone came in as an apprentice in the 70s they didn't going to work somewhere else wasn't even in consideration they would just stay there because that's where they learned and i feel like that's just not the case anymore it's it's just not that's when i would connect with your local um you know career centers or trade schools uh, where the their juniors and seniors because i know that those schools are looking for companies to send the students to when they get to a certain point. And then, so they've had some training with them and then you can, you know, kind of work with them and finish them up and then they can get to know you as well. And maybe after they graduate high school, uh, we have we have one student uh, that was in high school and he graduated in 2014 and um, he works all across the country, but whenever, you know, it's slow, like around Christmas time or whatever, he comes back and works for us for a few months every year. So 
uh, we have that kind of relationship going. So I think even if there's there are you know high school students, you can kind of work with somebody. So you're, it's not all on you as the company. You can get help with the, the schools in your area. What do you think we can do to make the skilled trades industry more attractive? You you said something at the first was great. You know, there is a there is a, a lot of pride when you can drive down the street and see a building that you participated in building, those kinds of things. So if if mom and dad have their son or daughter and take them to a job fair and it there's lined up and you've got the IT company and you've got Amazon and then you've got a construction company and a plumbing company, a machine shop, what do we need to do? in those moments to communicate to potential, to young people, to potential hires that this is a wonderful industry. You know, you, one of the things is, is absolutely right about the, you don't need a college degree and you mm -hmm. can make great money. What else can we do to make the, the, the skilled trades more attractive? Well, what I like to do is you want to have a diverse uh, personnel at these trade shows. So you just don't want to have a Caucasian male there. You want to have a couple people um, you know, female, male, uh, different, even different ethnicities. But what I like to do when I'm at job fairs is when I see somebody and sometimes students, they're just kind of walking by to get the free stuff or, you know, they're just there because they don't have to be in school. But what I try to engage them. And so I ask them, what are they interested in? And I can usually almost every time flip that into some sort of career in construction. So like, for example, you know, the kids right now are really into texting and video games and, and things of that sort. So when somebody mentions that, I said, oh, well, do you know that you can fly drones in the construction industry? And so if you can try and find out what they're interested in and then show them how it can be related into construction, that, that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing is I love to tell people is that, as I mentioned earlier, construction remained essential during the pandemic. And many of the construction projects continued to go on. So you were still employed. Whereas, you know, in the hospitality industry, you know, that was really completely shut down. So to let them know that you can continue to work when those thing, types of things happen is really um, beneficial. Again, mentioning you will have the college debt and have with you some, you know, statistics and salary ranges for the different positions, because if they can see what they can make in a year, uh, I think that that will also help them to realize that, you know, yeah, construction is is a viable career to get into and I can make money doing it. Many people today are, are single parents. And so they, they have to find something that they can live with just a single income and construction can do that for you. No, that's great. Um, you, you mentioned about earlier, you said you might get in trouble for saying what you said, but we all know it's true. I mean, it's really a just simple math when people are making 14, 15, 16 bucks an hour, they can stay home for more money. Yeah. Is that, that really affect you guys at, uh, at Hancock? It hasn't really affected us in, at Hancock in, except in the aspect of getting new employees. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very good solid uh, base and many of our employees have been here for over 25 years even. So it's just getting you know, the people to come in and stay. It, mm -hmm. It's that's that's the biggest thing that we're coming into because yeah, it turned out that you know like oh well wait a minute I can make more money, you know work for here for a little bit at this wage, then just go away because of the pandemic and get paid more. I mean because you they can play the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, they may make a little bit more you know being a welder or whatever. But then if they think about it, you know well the pandemic's still going on, the government's still going to pay me, so I'm going to make more money sitting at home than I would you know even being here as a welder. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, that has stopped pretty much. Hopefully, cross our fingers, we won't have mm -hmm. to do that again. And I understand why the government did it, but you always have people that take advantage of it. Right. So I personally, I think I would go nuts if I didn't have a job and wasn't keeping busy. Um, yeah. But, you know, there are people that, you know, can do that. And, you know, we're just now trying to build it back up where people have to start Oh yeah, I do have to start going to work now every day uh, and then trying to get them back into that because uh, it, if you're not used to getting up, we, we usually are work at seven in the morning and a lot of people aren't used to getting up that early. So it is going to be an adjustment for those people that maybe, you know, were at home and trying to get them back going again. Um, but 
I think you just need to keep communicating with those employees that are coming back from that. Because again, I understand the government was trying to help out, but if you can show them that they do need to be working again, but you, you know, you're trying to encourage them, just keep talking to them. I think that if you can keep that interaction with the employee, they're more willing to stay uh, because you're working with them and talking to them and asking them how they're doing. I think that's another key point to keeping people. Um, you, my boss, every day at some point in time of the day, he comes down and talks to me and sees what I'm doing, you know, how things are going. Um, and that should be done company-wide. Mm. You know, people, the, the supervisors, the owners should be talking to their employees all the time, asking how things are going and, and also asking them if they have any ideas. Because I think uh, when employees feel valued and that they're really a part of the team, that that, even for the generation, that feels uh, more, means more to them, I should say, than just the hourly rate or the salary that they're making is that they're, they're feeling part of something. Mm-hmm. You mentioned when I asked about the, the women to men ratio, you said finally at 10%. So are we on a trend upwards of women entering in the construction and blue collar industries? I think we are, but I, I think it's still going to be slow going. I mean, it took so long just to even get over 10%, but the thing that we're, we're seeing is that more women are, you know, seated at the table, making the decisions, you know, you're going to see more women out on the job sites. So I, we're making more of an impact, even though we're only that 10%, because we do have a different way of thinking than, than men do. And I think that that is being seen more as an advantage in the construction industry, you know, is we want to keep the projects in budget and get them done on time. And we have that kind of uh, mentality to be able to put together a plan and, you know, help to make it go hopefully a little bit smoother. You always have hiccups in construction, but having that interaction with, and the women's point of view, I think you're seeing more of. Um, We've had a lot of uh, companies reaching out to NAWIC to partner with us because they they see everything that women are doing. Uh, one of our partnerships is with OSHA. We have an alliance with OSHA and we're working with them on safety things for mm-hmm. uh, not only women, but everybody, because there are, are things that should be uh, done across the board. What do you think 2022 has in store for us? Do you feel like, I know in the energy industry and in the gas compression you know, oil has gone up, went back down. Now it's kind of back up. So in our industry, it feels like everyone's a little excited and feels like, Hey, we're, we're coming back. Let's, let's hire, let's spend some money on these capital projects. What, what do you feel like in the construction industry and and the, and those skilled trades? Yeah, I think that uh, we're going to see more projects coming uh, to light for out for bid. I know we're already, our steel fab shop is already at projects uh, through May all and right. If we get the next couple of projects, it's going to be through October. I mean, All have, right. I mean, I know 2022 is only next year, but um, the thing that we're still trying to get through is, of course, the the pricing. Now, oh. uh, it just depends on what you're doing. Uh, some people say it's kind of leveling off. Um, we haven't seen too much major increases, uh, at least on the structural steel side. Now, I I know on the pre-engineered metal building side, those pr- prices are still going up. Uh, the biggest problem we're having now is lead times, you know, with, with getting materials. Um, we, we do all the structural steel, we fab it, but um, somebody else takes care of the joists and deck. So um, we have to keep an eye on the lead times for joists and deck. And I know that those are already out into August uh, for anything that we would order, you know, within the next couple of weeks. So it's a little bit better than some of the pre-engineered buildings that are like a year plus out. And uh, that's an advantage actually to the, to our side, because yeah. they're going to say, okay, well, maybe we're not going to do a pre-engineered metal building. We'll just do a, a structural steel uh, base for it. And, you know, so we'll get more of it that way. But I do think that uh, 2022 will be a, an uptick. We'll have more construction. We'll be able to finally, hopefully get the lead times uh, under control. More people will need to get back into the workforce. Again, going back to our previous conversation, uh, people will have to start working again. So we'll be able to ramp up production more. Good. Well, that's great to hear that you're booked out and things are on the uptick. I love, it just feels like that's just the general consensus. So, uh, well, thanks for coming on. And I, yeah, our first woman to have on the podcast and and it's oh, appropriate cool. as the, is it, you call it NAWIC? Yeah. It's the National Association of Women in Construction 
you know, acronyms, construction is full of acronyms. Right, right. Well, cool. Well, thanks for coming on and, uh, and good luck in 2022. And um, maybe we'll talk again. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks.